The 2020 Mustang S550 EcoBoost. Now Mark and I have already done a video on the original EcoBoost in 2015. However, since then, the Mustang and the EcoBoost lineup as a whole has received some major updates. First in 2018 with a refresh, then again in 2020. So in this video, we're gonna walk you through all of the updates made to this car during its now five year life cycle and walk you through why you should or should not buy an EcoBoost Mustang. It's safe to say the typical buying demographic of a Mustang EcoBoost is dramatically different than the buyer who's looking at either a GT, GT350, or GT500. The reason they're buying an EcoBoost over those cars is either they don't value the extra performance or it's associated with cost. The EcoBoost is dramatically cheaper than the V8 offerings, both in running cost and associated MSRP. Now, the EcoBoost itself excels surprisingly well as a daily driver. The cabin is very, very usable. Interior space and practicality is where this car excels. The trunk specifically is enormous. When you fold down the rear seats, the amount of storage you can fit in this car is remarkable. Mark and I recently in one of our shoots managed to stuff car ramps, car scales, external lighting, a camera bag, slider, and tripod in the back of this thing with relative ease. The front seats specifically are very comfortable. You have two seating options on an EcoBoost, Recaro's or standard touring seats. And those touring seats come in either cloth or leather. These are the leather offerings granted with the premium package. They're heated and cooled. They breathe surprisingly well. Don't break down over long road trips. The rest of the interior of this car is pretty standard. And I mean that in a good way. It doesn't feel particularly remarkable. However, you do not sacrifice things like exterior visibility, or storage capacity. The door cards are huge, you have an enormous glove box, and the center armrest area is cavernous, and there's a USB port in it. In fact, you have two USB ports in this car. On the note of electronics, that's really the thing that's changed in the S550 over the years. After 2015, Ford went away from my Ford Touch to Ford Sync, which added things like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. The infotainment itself is very easy to use. It's intuitive and straightforward. In 2018, when they refreshed this car, they added the option of a digital dash. So now you have two gauge cluster options, a analog set of gauges, which are easy to read, easy to navigate, that little foreign screen they give you, or this now entirely configurable digital dash. Your tack, your speedo, that all changes in layout based upon your drive mode. So also added things like my mode, which is an individual drive mode, which wasn't offered in the past. The last thing to bring up on the interior electronics front is, well, the audio system. This is the base audio system, not the new Bang & Olufsen system, and it's terrible. However, it is quiet in here. The noise floor is very low. So theoretically, if you went to a component set of speakers, like from Vocal or something along those lines, you could probably improve your experience tenfold. So with that, let's head to the shop. We're underneath the Ford EcoBoost, Jack, and this is a bit nostalgic for me because one of the first videos that we ever did together was a Ford Mustang video. Yep, five years ago, Mark. Five years ago. It's crazy how time moves on, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We can talk about that on the side. In the bathroom. In the bathroom, yep. So as a car enthusiast, as somebody that's excited about performance machines, my meter is extremely low, but that's not what this... Mustang is about and you had a chance to talk with the project lead one of the project engineers named Tom Barnes He spent about an hour with me and we discussed this product from basically head to toe Okay, and as this is the volume seller, right? Everyone knows the four popper Mustang Formerly the v6 Mustang is a car that has to be sold to fleet companies and to everybody else So he has the unenviable task to make sure this car doesn't alienate the core Mustang buyer and it is safe to say, as I said in the interior segment, there are many different groups of people who buy Mustangs. The EcoBoost, specifically the non-high performance variant, and we'll talk about that underneath the engine bay, is meant to basically target the person who's looking for a replacement 
for a daily driver. Someone who likes the styling, likes the image of this car, and wants something that it doesn't really offend them in any way. It's just a regular car to them with a little bit of fun. So one of the interesting parts about this when you look at it, we've done so many Mustang videos that a lot of this underneath is the same. But from if you're gonna look at this from a car lover's perspective or a car person or a business perspective, like you talked about, they have to make this sell. There's no other vehicle that's like this that has to be attainable to, to a wide range of people from the high end to the GT500 all the way down to a normal person that who can- Who has no perspective, perspective of performance. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize, at least from the, review, the reviewer's perspective, is we drive everything. Mm -hmm. And to the regular person, a 300 horsepower rear wheel drive car is sporty and it is fast. And you could afford to buy this. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing that we start to lose sight on. Ford could not, they could not continue to make this if they only sold like 8,000 of these a year. The reason why it continues and they have the money to sink into the higher end versions or the enthusiast products. Volume seller. Volume seller. That's why this is here. And let's get into some of the mechanical stuff that they did. So this is a McPherson Strut multi-link rear car. And in 2018, the S550 generation Mustangs were refreshed, both exterior and mechanical wise. So in the front, they changed the suspension offerings in the EcoBoost. So specifically, you have three packages. And in Europe, it changes a little bit as the base car is standard with the old performance package. But now you have the base suspension, which is basically for the Camry buyer. You have the high performance package, which is either Magna Ride equipped or not Magna Ride equipped. And then you have the handling package, which adds 265s and a similar suspension package, what you get in the Performance Pack 2 car. So the way that they spec this out is really, for the American market, super soft, very comfortable, daily driver. A little bit sporty, and yeah. then basically a real substitute for a hot hatchback. All right, so let's talk about the middle and back half of the car, Jack. So in 2018, as I talked about, they refreshed this whole car. And if you want to know more about a lot of those details, watch the bullet video we did because that was like a summary of everything. But in terms of the four popper version, you have a 10 speed automatic, which has gone away from the old six speed. And you have a revised MT82 six speed manual. Both are actually fairly competent. In fact, the engineer says the 10 speed automatic better suits the personality of the base model 2.3. But the six speed is again, now a twin disc clutch, revise some of the internals to get away some of the various issues with the MT82 from years past. But because this car makes less torque than the V8 offering, it should be fairly stout. Yeah, and again, it's good that they have the two transmission options because when we got this, I'm like, I'm glad it, I was super happy that it had a manual. And then you start to drive it and you're like, I don't know, it, it doesn't really need it. I think it like I think that I would agree with that statement that having an automatic in this car really is probably gonna fit the buying demographic that it's nice that it's an option, and yes, you know, it adds a little bit of sporty flair, but I think the 10 speed in the base 2.3 better suits the character, and you lose rev matching from oh, okay. the GT in this car. All right, let's head to the back. We'll talk about it a bit more. All right. In the back, this looks like most of the other Mustangs we've seen. Now, there are some subtle differences, so you're going to detail what those are. So yes, just like in other Mustangs, you have a multi-link rear end. Obviously, the suspension is much different back here, but most notably, when compared to regular coupes as you can pick different rear gear sets so you have a 315 331 or 355 rear gear ratio there's Based not too many companies doing that no. it's, it's a good option but why would you choose the different <laughs> how aggressive you want the car or if you get the handling package with the high performance package you get a torsen rear diff with 355 ah, rear gears makes sense okay so what else we got going on back here? Is there anything else? Really the only change or notable change moving past 2018 with the EcoBoost Mustang is you have a optional high performance exhaust. So it's a valved exhaust like you get in a performance pack GT. So you can pick tour, hmm. sport, or track. Well, this has the old fashioned one. It's just some with metal the suitcase. Pipe. Yeah, with the suitcase <laughs> in the middle. So let's talk about engines. So this is the base base four-cylinder EcoBoost. Yes, and what we're gonna talk about on the drive is this motor, you know, it makes 300 horsepower, but there are some tuning issues with this drivetrain. So based upon your heat or fuel conditions or whatever, it will pull timing, and that's largely due to emissions, according to the engineer I talked to. But if you opt for the high-performance package, they drop in the motor that came from the RS. The Focus RS. So that's 
kind of the leftover from that generation of car. It's a little different. Obviously, it's mounted differently, not, this not being a front-wheel drive based car. And the turbos are different, so it has a little more boost. But that car, the manual is what you should get because, in fact, it will spool all the way out to redline and it makes a ton of power. Okay. So we've covered this enough. And if you want, again, if you want to see more about the Mustang and all its iterations, we've covered pretty much every version of that car. So do a search. But let's take this for a drive and see what it's like. All right. Back in yet another Mustang market. totally blow the doors off of a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you one thing. Obviously, I'm not too excited about this, but then again... This I'm, isn't for you. Yeah, it's not for me, but the one thing that's that makes this way better is having a manual transmission option. While I don't think it's necessarily technically the better mated transmission to this engine, it takes it from basically regular economy car to a little bit fun of a daily driver and that's really what this car is as we talked about in the shop this is not a substitute for a v8 mustang and to be fair it's not trying to be this is for the man or woman who's going to buy this as their sporty car and they don't really have the perspective of owning something like a gt350 or gt500 or they don't need that type of power for their daily drive yeah this if you're going to use as a daily something that needs to get pretty decent fuel economy over 30 on the highway, higher 20s combined. This accomplishes that. This accomplishes that in spades. Yeah, I, I guess I would agree with you. And it's hard to put in perspective when you think of Mustang. You always think of V8s. You think of tires burning. Oh, at least the modern ones. And you know you forget that those are the weekend cars. Those really are when you get to the higher trim GTs with like the PP2s and the GT350s and GT500s, nobody is gonna drive those every day. And this is that car, I guess you Yeah, could. being the volume seller, this is what makes those other cars possible. And I will say talking to a couple of our viewers who own these, who I'm gonna be honest, like you, I dismissed this car and as being not a Mustang or not what I wanted. But I think it accomplishes its mission in life pretty well. Let's talk about suspension and body control. You mean it's a couch on wheels? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and that's great, really, for, it. you know, if you're driving this on a boring-ass commute, the last thing you want to do is be getting getting beat up, having a drone, a drone experience, and this has none of that. Now, I guess the counter-argument could be made, then what's the point? But here's two things. Compared to a typical four popper, like, you know, your Velosters and your Civics and all that, it's still real wheel drive or rear wheel drive, right wheel drive. 40 and slip there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get the rotation. You can still have some fun and it's a good learning tool if you ever want to move into something a little bit more powerful. This still is safe. This is not the crash into a crowd Mustang. If you could crash this, that I'd takes like a, to see. a serious <laughs> yeah, talent. At least on dry payment. So, well, what do you think of it? To me, this makes me appreciate the engineers at Ford Performance and what they can accomplish with the GT350 and GT500 even more. Because if you blindfolded you, and I put earplugs in you, and you rode in this car, and you rode in a GT500 or GT, GT350, you would not think they were remotely related. No. And that's, I mean, it's not really a bad thing when you get into a corner. The front end washes out yeah. a little bit. The it tires. It's a very safely tuned car for the mass market of people that really want the looks of the Mustang, the name, the the attainability of the price point, without all of the drama and excitement that disappears. And all the negative months. parts associated with that. Yeah. Really, in that department, I think this car excels. It's the front end feels big, and it's not the most communicative, but as a daily, it does well. My only complaint with this car, in the base EcoBoost that this is, is the drivetrain. I'm going to demonstrate why. It 
doesn't wind out quickly, which in a four popper, small displacement, performance motor is a disappointment. And the way it delivers power, it's cutting timing, it's cutting boost, for no real reason at all, at least perceived to the driver. Well, we're running 93 octane here, and this is just something that I complain about with a lot of modern four cylinders. And we've talked to enough engineers to understand why the, con the experience has gotten more inconsistent. You're trying to take a small displacement engine, jam a ton of boost into it, try to give it this huge horsepower number while still maintaining the fuel economy numbers and all the emission standards that go with it. So that's just the reality of something like this. It's not gonna be, this is not a high performance machine. It wasn't designed to be, it's, it's designed to give the buyers just a taste of the Mustang brand. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think if you want a sporty EcoBoost, they make one in the high performance pack. And you know, for most people, they're not gonna notice the inconsistency in tuning. It delivers a lot of torque down low and it makes decent power and it is pretty quick. It's mid 60s in the low, you know, five second range and all the inputs, specifically the manual gearbox, pedal box is superb. It's really easy to heel toe in and the, you know, the gearbox is still an MT82. It's an accessible yeah. car. For, from an enthusiast perspective, this car sucks. From a normal person car, like somebody that's not ridiculous like us, this is mostly what every single person would dream of having. And I, I get it, I totally get it, and I don't get it at the same time. It's, it's confusing. So I guess with that, Mark, you wanna to head to the final thoughts? Not really. <laughs> Final thoughts on the EcoBoost Mustang. Now we've already done a video of this a long time ago. The evolution of it has not changed all that much, but the main takeaways are as this, this platform has evolved, they've gotten more ho higher horsepower variants from the GT, the GT350, the 500. You can see just how capable this car is. That's not this. This is a value proposition for somebody that's trying to get into the brand, the Mustang brand. The other part is, we all don't live in a world where we have disposable income. We have other responsibilities and not everybody can go out and dump $50,000 on a weekend car. So this kind of tries to do everything that you need from fuel economy, going to a dealership and not getting bent over. They're very common. You can negotiate the prices down and you still get a lot of the good things that Mustang is known for. The other parts to talk about are comfort. This is extremely comfortable. You can still, it has a usable trunk. It reminds me a lot of the Ford Fusion in terms of usability. The back seats aren't totally horrific to get in. And if you're a bigger person, this is something you can use every day. You can go on your drive to work and never think twice about it. The fact that it still has a manual transmission, it's real wheel drive with optional gear ratios in the back. There's not too many cars like this on the market and I can see why it's such a volume seller. And if you're an enthusiast, we talked about this in the shop. This is the reason why we get higher end Mustangs. They sell the hell out of these. So they have the money left over to continue development on more exciting products. Is this the best driving thing ever? No, and it's not trying to be. It's gonna scratch that itch for somebody that doesn't need all the crazy horsepower and all the other things that the other cars bring. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.